Good morning, everybody, and welcome to PSG of Mercer County. The Professional Service Group of Mercer County is a group that is here for you, for anyone that is in a career transition. And of course, as I say every Friday, happy Aloha Friday. So uh, yes, I'm not being disrespectful for those of you who are new to our visiting us today. I do wear Hawaiian shirts every Friday, just my thing to do. Uh, someone complained to me yesterday, they did not see me in Hawaiian shirt, it was Thursday. So typically don't wear them on a Thursday. And also I am wearing a blue colored Hawaiian shirt, it has nothing to do with blue Hawaii, the drink or Elvis Presley or anything like that. Today is National Wear Blue Day. And so it's, uh, it's actually, um, Men's Health is in focus on National Wear Blue Day, and it's always the Friday right before Father's Day. So, of course, Father's Day weekend is coming up. Hope those of you who are dads will be celebrating, and those of you who are moms with dads will be celebrating as well, and those of you who are children with dads will be celebrating. The BSG of Mercer County Group is here to help anybody who is in any kind of career transition. It doesn't really matter why or what caused your former employer uh, to let you go or why you've made the decision to be in a career transition. Sometimes it is due to a former employer, sometimes we take time off for our own personal needs, or other times we make the decision to make a career change. And we're here to provide you with, with some a little bit of guidance, a little bit of help, certainly a lot of um, resources that you can use to help you become more efficient and more effective with your own job search. Uh, among the resources that we have, we do have our LinkedIn group. It is called PSG of Mercer County. So if you are on LinkedIn and as a job seeker, you should be uh, active and on LinkedIn. Do search for our LinkedIn group, PSG of Mercer County. When you find the group, click the join button or join us or join group, whatever that button is, and you will be instantly put into pending steps. And we do that on purpose just to let you know. We do check about twice a week uh, people who do make the request. And the reason why we put you in pending status is we're just kind of protecting people, protecting all of us as members from people who are just joining for their own benefit. We've noticed over the years, name collectors and list collectors are trying to, group collectors are trying to get in, and we just want to make sure we keep people out who are just into it for themselves. What you will find in general is that the members or attendees of our LinkedIn group, we have over 1,700 members in our LinkedIn group alone, tend to be pretty good at responding when you write to them. And as a member of our group, any of those other 1,700 people, even if they are not yet your first degree connections, you can write to them, because you can write to anyone uh, in LinkedIn who's in a group, even if you don't have that premium package. Without premium, you can only write to people who are first degree connections or in your group. Um, so when you're in your, our group, please um, be a little bit active. Uh, maybe you someone's posting an article you see it's interesting, I write a comment that you thought it was interesting. LinkedIn likes their members to be active, and when you become more active, you might float a little bit higher up over time when people start doing searches for people like you. Uh, we also do have our website. Our website is psgofmercercounty.org, psgofmercercounty.org, and it is more than just a landing page. It is actually over 120 web pages of content. There's a tremendous amount of information that we've uh, cultivated over the years and made available to anyone because it's on the, the web, but with certainly all of you in mind. It's a website for anyone who's in a career search. Uh, among the pages that we have, we have a menu on the top, and one of the menu items is resources. Resources is a page that has, well, resources. It's all links and logos. There are 48 different resources that are there right now, uh, links to 16 other networking groups, groups that are like this for job seekers. Um, there are 32 other career resources which include uh, websites like ONET, um, some of the different state resources, not just New Jersey, we have Delaware, Philadelphia, uh, New Jersey, um, Pennsylvania, and New York. Um, we have one link to a personal wellness site if you uh, want to get a little bit involved with that, and even a mental health site as well. We're not saying everyone needs to click all those, but if those are topics of interest to you, may be a good place to get started. The other big announcement, and we're actually very uh, excited about this, uh, PSG of Mercer County will soon be only in person in our format. We will no longer be hosting 
uh, virtual meeting or a hybrid meeting. Uh, our last virtual meeting will be June 30th. So this week and two more weeks, we will be in person only. There are other groups that are still uh, virtual. There are other groups that are still hybrid. Several groups are becoming in person. So we're gonna be an in-person option, just the way we always were for many years before COVID took over. So we will encourage you to come on back and see us in person. And our first meeting in person will be July 14th. We're taking July 4th week off. And so thanks to the library, we'll have some uh, coffee and tea. We'll have some other cookies and treats. We'll make a little bit of a party. So I hope that you can come visit us in Princeton. I certainly know some of you on the call may be a little bit far, not able to get here. And so I'm sorry uh, that that change may affect you. But uh, long term for this group and for the attendees, I think it'll be a good decision and benefit for all of us. So in just a moment, I will be turning over the meeting to Michael. And uh, in just as ahead of me doing that, I'm going to introduce him. And again, I ask that you do keep your microphones on mute. By the way, Michael, please do not keep your microphone on mute. Uh, we do want to hear all the good things that you have for us. And so with that, PSG of Mercer County is pleased to welcome Dr. Michael Brenner. As a founder and CEO of Right Cord Leadership, Dr. Michael Brenner collaborates with leaders and teams at all levels to strengthen, strengthen the essential skills needed for peak performance. He achieves this by drawing on more than two decades of experience as an international leadership consultant, executive coach, keynote speaker, and educator, and for more than 35 years, a professional musician. Michael has partnered with leading organizations in a variety of industries. He has worked for several not-for-profit organizations as well, including United Way and Habitat for Humanity. Michael holds a doctorate in adult learning and leadership from Columbia University and a master's degree in adult and organizational development from Temple University. He has taught courses in organizational behavior, systems dynamics, negotiations, and interpersonal skills. Michael has been a featured speaker at many industry events and conferences around the world, including Southeast Asia, Canada, and Australia. And just to let you know, his presentation kind of style today will be, he's gonna go through all the bullet points, all the slides, and he'll save plenty of time at the end of the program today uh, for questions and answers for both virtual and in-person. And with that, PSG of Mercer County is very pleased to welcome Dr. Michael Brenner. Hey. Hi, hi, hi. That's good. Thank you so much, David. Uh, welcome, everybody. Oh, I've got some background noise there. Um, it's a pleasure to be with you. Thank you for your attention, time. Um, uh, yes, do do make sure that your mics are on a mute unless I ask you to take them off for various exercises or what have you. Uh, and um, really, I'm delighted to have been invited to uh, be delighted to have been invited. That sounds like a country song. Uh, to spend uh, some time with you this morning on a topic that um, I've taught for two decades uh, that I hope that you will find helpful as well. A uh, couple of preliminary comments. Um, the hat. Right. So I debated, should I mention the hat or not? I thought, well, I don't have to mention why I'm wearing a hat. Maybe they'll think it's just kind of a cool branding thing. But um, there's another reason for wearing the hat, which coincidentally dovetails nicely with what David just said about uh, Men's Health Day or something, which I didn't know about. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I guess I look kind of dapper in this hat. But the more important reason for wearing it is I just um, I'm, I came off of a case of shingles, a rather nasty case of shingles. Uh, and so I have some some scarring above my left eye, which is um, fortunately getting a lot better, but um, it's, you know, it's not great. So the hat serves double purpose, making me look kind of cool and also sort of covering up and protecting uh, the, the skin that's still healing. Um, I know we live in a very fraught political environment where, you know, vaccinations, uh, you know, depending on how you feel about vaccinations. So I'm not going to I'm not going to go down a rabbit hole with regard to vaccinations. All I will say is you do not want this. <laughs> uh, this is caused by the same virus that causes chicken pox. So if you had chicken pox, you are susceptible to getting shingles. And there is an effective vaccine out there called Shingrex. Uh, which you can look into if you are amenable to 
uh, vaccines. And that's all I will say about that. Now, on to the topic of the day. I'm going to go in and put my presentation in presentation uh, mode like that. In doing so, I am no longer able to see your lovely faces. So I have to imagine that you're out there listening to me because all I can see right now is just my slides. So uh, David, you're gonna be my eyes and ears. If there's chatter in the chat, uh, let me know. Uh, if there's technical issues or you can't hear something or can't see something, do let me know. As David mentioned, I'm the founder and CEO of a company called Right Cord Leadership. I'm based out of Broomall, Pennsylvania, which is Delaware County, Pennsylvania. My wife, however, works for a pharmaceutical company whose headquarters are in Canada, but whose US headquarters are in, you guessed it, Princeton. So we've had a chance to go to Princeton a few times and even have nice, a nice meal or two. And uh, Princeton is great. I, I think Princeton's a wonderful town. So if it was a little closer, I might have showed up in person, but uh, it's about 75 minutes away. So we're doing the virtual thing today. Um, before we get into how to leverage emotional intelligence for your job or career search, we better define what emotional intelligence is. You may hear it referred to as EI or EQ uh, in contrast to intelligence quotient or IQ. Now, I, I assume many of you have heard of emotional intelligence or may even be quite familiar with emotional intelligence, but maybe have not thought about or considered how it can help you in your job or career search. So today's workshop is not specifically about networking, although we'll talk about networking. It's not specifically about um, interviews, although we'll talk about interviews. It's really about this concept of EQ and how it can help your broad job search in many different important ways. Okay. Um, so quickly about IQ. IQ is something we're all familiar with. It's how we traditionally measured intelligence for many, many decades. And just to keep it simple, IQ is really associated with cognitive abilities. Um, the, the way we would typically think about what it means to be smart. You might think about doing well on a test, or you might think about you know, the brainy kid in your high school class who just got A's on everything without studying, we'd say, yeah, you know, smart, smart person, high IQ. Uh, and, you know, this was a perfectly reasonable way of thinking about what it means to be intelligent uh, for many, many decades. I'm not sure exactly when the concept of IQ was first conceptualized, but it, it, it's it's been quite a while. Now, Fast forward to the 80s, mid 80s, late 80s, we had a group of social scientists, researchers, academics who started to think about the concept of intelligence very differently. And for them, yes, it was about the traditional IQ skills, but it was also about something very, very different. It was about emotional intelligence. And those two words together are sort of counter uh, counterintuitive. Emotional intelligence, what does that mean? Well, it turns out that it had very little, if anything, to do with book smarts or, or getting A's in, in, in school. And one of the pioneers of EQ, a fellow by the name of Dan Goldman, Daniel Goldman, Dr. Dan Goldman, his book, uh, that came out in 1995, I believe, and it was titled Emotional Intelligence, Why It Matters More Than IQ, was the bridge from academia to um, the masses in terms of emotional intelligence. And his book became an instant bestseller. Now, he defined emotional intelligence as follows. The capacity for recognizing our own feelings and those of others for motivating ourselves and for managing emotions well in ourselves and others. Okay. So there's a metaphor that I like to use with my clients that I think takes Dr. Goldman's definition and makes it a little simpler for us to understand. Now, the metaphor comes from my experience as a professional musician, which is something David mentioned in the introduction. 
So I've been playing music since I was a little kid and I've been playing professionally since I was a teenager. Now, my primary instrument is a saxophone. This is a photo of me playing the tenor. This is a photo of me playing the soprano sax, not a clarinet. So it's a, the, the long skinny horn is a soprano sax. And uh, I can get around on a flute, not the greatest flute player, but I can play the flute. Now, these photos are kind of old, so I'm gonna show you a more recent photo. Yeah, so obviously that's not a more recent photo. That was taken um, quite a while ago, and I'll just, I'll just leave it at that. Now, here's the metaphor. Those of you who are musically inclined listening to my voice this morning, know that what we're looking at on the screen are chords. How do I know it's a chord? Because that stacking of the notes indicates that they should be played at the same time. And that's really what a chord is. It's typically three or more notes played at the same time. Now, if I had a piano here and I played a particular chord, uh, a particular arrangement or grouping of notes, you might say, well, Mike, that's a really pleasing chord. That, that sounds really pleasant to my ear. I might play a different chord with a different collection of notes, and you might say, oh, I don't like the sound of that chord. That sounds very harsh, or that sounds very dissonant. You know who else plays chords? We do. We play chords. Now, not literal chords, but in terms of the energy that we put out every day, or I like to say the way we show up in life day to day to day could be labeled chords, right? Just like a piano plays, you can play a chord on a piano or strum a chord on a guitar. Sometimes the chords we play are a little out of tune. <laughs> Right? And you probably know people whose chords are perpetually out of tune. Now, more normally, we might have a bad moment or even a bad day where we play some sour notes and out of tune chords and our outcomes and results sort of follow. Right. On the other hand, when our chords are aligned or harmonious, or I like to say in the groove, our outcomes and results are much different. <laughs> Right? Totally different feel. You can hear in that little piece how that the drums and the bass are just providing that propulsive rhythm and that saxophone is just leaping and dancing, you know, on top of that rhythmic foundation and it just feels joyful and happy. So the metaphor, folks, is, you know, when it comes to your career transition, the chords you play or don't play can, can really help or hurt you. And I think that's kind of a that's how I like to think about this thing called emotional intelligence. It's the sum total of the chords you play or don't play moment to moment, day after day, right? Year after year. And the reason I can make this assertion is when it comes to IQ, think about this, the people that are vying for the same positions that you're vying for probably have more or less, they're probably as smart as you think about it. If you want to be an engineer, the other people vying for that position are probably smart enough to be engineers. Otherwise, why would they be pursuing that position? If you're pursuing a, a nursing position, the other people vying for that position are probably smart enough to be nurses. Otherwise, why would they be vying for that nursing position? So IQ is not necessarily where you're going to distinguish yourself from all the other people going after that position. Where you're going to distinguish yourself is with your EQ skills, which we're going to get into next. OK, if you can distinguish yourself, yes, you have the cognitive skills, you have the, 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 the IQ to succeed in the job. I'm going to want to know as a prospective employer, what else do you bring to the table? What else makes you different or distinctive or unique in terms of your people skills, your interpersonal skills? your EQ skills. So that's why I feel so strongly about this connection between EQ and 
job and career transitions, okay, which is why I created this program. Now, if this sounds easy, you know, what Dr. Daniel, uh, Dr. <laughs> Daniel Goldman said, uh, managing our own emotions and motivating ourselves and being aware of others' emotions, I assure you it's not, okay? Um, it, strengthening your emotional intelligence requires dedication, commitment, and most of all, a desire to strengthen those skills. And there's people out there that, you know, they're not, they're not particularly interested in, in getting better or improving in these skills. Uh, and you, you probably know who those people are. I trust that because you are attending this program today, that you are not one of those individuals and that you are willing and, and, and committed to the prospect of increasing your emotional intelligence for the purpose of um, you know, improving your chances of winning at the job transition game. Now, let's talk about the specific competencies associated with emotional intelligence. And there are a lot of them, but to keep things simple, I'm going to share four buckets or four categories, if you will. And we're going to take uh, a look at each of these in turn. So we have sort of defined at a, at a high level what emotional intelligence is. And now we're going to look at four key competencies that define emotional intelligence. The first is self-awareness. The second is self-management. The third is social awareness. And the fourth is relationship management. And as we go through uh, an exploration of each of these competencies, I want you to think about which of these are strengths for you and which are potential liabilities or vulnerabilities for you, because you wanna to continue to do the things that you're doing to leverage the strengths and you wanna consider maybe playing some different chords, right? There's that metaphor, playing some different chords to strengthen or increase or enhance uh, those competencies that you deem uh, to be liabilities potentially. Right out of the gate, we wanna talk about self-awareness, recognizing your emotions and their potential impact. Now, how many of you sometimes feel like these little guys? Is this a typical day for you? Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. But I know for a lot of people it is. You are running around, you have professional obligations, you have personal obligations, you have meetings, you have emails, you have networking events. And, and sometimes it's all you can do to just keep your feet under your body. Kind of like the, like a mad scramble. Maybe not every moment of the day, but you know, this is a feature of modern life. Now, you might say to me, yeah, Mike, sometimes I do feel that way. So what? Well, here's the so what. When we are in a perpetual state of activity, a perpetual state of, of doing, it's easy to get disconnected from our emotions. I mean, it's rare that somebody takes the time during the day to stop and take stock of their emotional state. You know, it's just not something we typically do. Now, normally that's not a big deal, but here's where it can become problematic. See, above the surface, it appears that Mike or David or whomever is functioning just fine, right? To look at them, you'd think, yeah, they're doing okay. I don't see any obvious or telltale signs of stress or distress or anything that would lead me to think that something is amiss. But under the surface could be this toxic brew of negative emotions sort of marinating, right? Let's say that, uh, uh, you know, you have uh, an unsatisfying encounter with somebody and you're feeling a little frustrated because you thought that encounter or that interaction was going to be more fruitful. So now you're a little frustrated. Something else happens, particular day, maybe the next day that irritates you, 
a little bit, maybe something at home. You know, you've asked your teenage kid to do something over and over and over and they haven't done it. So now you're frustrated and irritated. And now something occurs that you're you're a little resentful. Let's say that you thought you were perfect for a particular job opening and you got that letter. Uh, we had, uh, you know, a lot of wonderful candidates and we've gone in a different direction, but we'll keep your resume on file should things change. We've all gotten that letter. So now you have compounded frustration and irritation with resentment because you really felt like that job was perfect for you. And the more you think about it, the more disappointed you get. You really felt like this was the one for you. Now imagine sort of operating with all of these negative emotions percolating below the surface. So far, you've managed to tamp them down. You have managed to continue to be you know, productive, but you're still feeling all this stuff. And then what happens? The proverbial straw that breaks the camel's back, the proverbial spark to the, you know, dry straw or whatever metaphor you want to use. And boom, all of that toxicity leaps to the surface in a moment uh, of irrationality. And, you know, we end up saying and doing things that maybe we regret. Now, if you think about it, this was the result of being disconnected from those emotions for quite a while. We lacked the self-awareness to tune into those emotions and deal with them appropriately as they emerged. And so they built up, they built up, they built up, and then boom, that one event, that one incident, that one nasty email, whatever it is, somebody cuts you off in traffic and all hell breaks loose. Okay, this is not unusual. How do we how do we mitigate this? Well, the solution is to plug back in to our emotions. See, our emotions are a rich source of information and they're always there. Our emotions are always there. The question is, are we attuned to them? Are we connected to them? When we plug back into our emotions, when we are in fact self-aware, we can see where our thoughts and emotions are guiding us, as opposed to being led by the nose, <laughs> by our emotions along a pathway that may not be constructive or healthy. And so we need to get away from this emotions as being you know, soft and fuzzy and wimpy. And no, emotions are powerful, conveyors of information do we have the emotional do we have the emotional intelligence to tune in and listen now i'm going to give you a quick exercise to help us the good news is we don't have to go to some mountaintop and sit there in silent meditation in order to tune in to our emotions more frequently i mean you can do that if you want but it's not necessary all you really need to do is borrow a page from the airports that we frequently uh, visit. The, the metal detector where, you know, we got to stay in there and it, it scans us for, for metal, specifically weapons, uh, you know, or sometimes water. But anyway, you get the idea. Using the airport scanner as a metaphor, we can create our own scanner. It's not scanning us for metal it's scanning our emotional state in the moment. And I'd like you to think about doing this right now as I describe the exercise. Imagine a line from zero to 100, and zero is the least stressed you can imagine yourself being. If you are a fan of the beach, picture yourself on a warm, sunny day uh, with your toes in the sand, those are not my feet, by the way, um, and just gazing out at the, at the rolling surf with the companion of your choice, or maybe not, maybe you're by yourself, and you are totally relaxed. A hundred is the most stressed you can be. It's deciding to cool off in the water, and you go out a few yards, and you look down, and there is our fishy buddy from a few, few slides back, um, you know, sizing you up for a hot lunch and you are really stressed. Now, 50 is sort of a midpoint. Um, whether you are live at the library or joining virtually, 
if you're live at the library, turn to somebody next to you and just let them know what number are you at right now as you sit here listening to me. And if you are listening virtually, I'd like you to put that number in the chat, okay? From zero least stressed to 100 most stressed, go ahead and do that right now. I'll give you 30 seconds to share your number in person or in the chat. So in the chat, we see 30, 40, 22.5, 20, 10, 70, 60, 20, and we hear a few numbers, but they're all blending together here in the meeting. Okay. So it sounds like we have what a typical variety of numbers, which is totally common. So what do we do with this information? Well, unless you just randomly spit out a number, which maybe you did, 99% of you that went through the, the exercise went through a specific process. And I suspect that that process had to do with some sort of internal reflection where you quickly scanned all the things going on in your life, all of your obligations, all of your pressing engagements, and think about like an emotional Rolodex. If you don't know what a Rolodex is, ask your kids or your grandkids. Or I, I, let me reverse that. Ask your parents or grandparents. Right? Um, this audience knows what a Rolodex is. <laughs> most people of a certain age remember a Rolodex. But you flip through it. You got a sense for what's going on in your life at this moment. And you associated it with a number, either a lower number, a higher number, or a mid number. This is literally an exercise to bring self-awareness to your emotional state in the moment. And I encourage you to do it several times a day. Maybe you get up in the morning, you do Mike's quick self-awareness exercise, you're at a 10 or a 20, feeling pretty good, positive emotions, you're ready to start the day. If you wake up in the morning uh, and you're at an 80 or an 85, that's telling you something. You can spend the day marinating in an 80 or 85, but knowing that that's not going to be really productive for you, you can take steps to lower that number, which is the next step of the process. But the first step is awareness, bringing that number that represents your emotion into your consciousness, onto your radar, so that you can then make choices or decisions regarding what to do about that emotion. So I say work that muscle, do it in the morning, do it in the afternoon and do, do it before going to bed. And this will literally strengthen that connection I talked about between your consciousness and your emotional state. And you'll be able to glean the information that your emotions are telling you. And if you find that you're not in a good emotional state, you can take steps to mitigate that. If you find that you are, are in a positive emotional state, that's great. You can do whatever you're doing to stay there. Okay. Something else to think about, another exercise in self-awareness. Which of the following describes you best when you're doing an activity related to your career transition? Maybe you're on LinkedIn, maybe you're working on your resume, maybe you're attending a networking event, something associated with your career transition. A, energetic, optimistic, ready to show the world what you can do. Calm, focused, ready to get down to business and make progress. C, cranky, frustrated, annoyed that you still have to do this stuff, or D, gloomy, pessimistic, and wishing you could just go back to bed. Now, you don't have to share your answer. Just think about the letter in your mind. What are we doing? We are bringing awareness to your emotional state when you are typically involved in activities associated with your career transition. Once you bring awareness to that, to that state through the A, B, C, or D designation, you should ask yourself, is this helping or hindering me? Because if your answer was A or B, that's good, that's good. But if your answer as you reflect on this question is, you know what, it's a, it's a lot of the time it's C, to be honest, or a lot of the times it's D, to be honest, you have a choice. You can continue that, uh, that dynamic for yourself, or you can take steps to move yourself into a more productive emotional state, okay? You always have that choice. You always have that choice. 
But there's a saying that goes, if you always do what you've always done, you will always get what you've always got. If you always do what you've always done, you'll always get what you've always got. So if you choose to stay at C or D, you can probably expect outcomes or results that mirror that choice. But the first step again is awareness, being aware of our emotions from moment to moment, especially when we are engaged in activities uh, associated with our career transition, okay? Keep in mind something the great jazz trumpeter Louis Armstrong once said, you, you blows who you is, you blows who you is, meaning that for him, that sound that came out through his trumpet was a reflection of how he was feeling. If his playing was joyful and um, and and ebullient, ab ebullient, ebullient, you know that word. Um, but right then, it came out through his horn. If he was feeling maybe sad or blue, that came out through his horn. So remember, when you blows who you is your results in life, your results in your career transition reflect in many ways your temperament, your EQ, the way you feel about yourself, the way you feel about your prospects. So that's the, um, that's the role of self-awareness in this whole process because you blows who you is and your results or outcomes are going to reflect how you're feeling, okay? So some questions to help you increase your self-awareness. How plugged in are you to your emotions from moment to moment? Do you ever stop to take stock of your emotional state throughout the day? Well, I've just given you a couple of tools to help you do that. What situations make you afraid or sad or anxious or angry? How can you anticipate and mentally prepare for them to get better outcomes? If you know that you get anxious during interviews, you have a choice to make. You can stay anxious when you interview, or you can take steps to mitigate that anxiety and become better at interviewing, okay? That's always your choice. Do strong emotions sneak up on you during periods of stress? And if they do, how might you become more aware of them before they do damage? In other words, how can you strengthen that connection between your emotions and your awareness, your consciousness, so that any negative emotions don't lead to actions that you're going to regret. So this, you can see, this is not uh, easy stuff. This requires a great deal of, of self-reflection and the desire to get better uh, in terms of these competencies. And um, you can do it. You know, it's, it's something that I do regularly. I think about these questions and and, you know, I teach this stuff and, and, and I continue to do this stuff. So it's, it's something we all can do and probably all should be doing. So own your feelings, tune into them, listen to them, and get to know yourself better every day. That's really the key to self-awareness. Let's pivot now to self-management. Once you are aware of your emotions, what do you do with them? What choice do you make? regarding them. Now, I'd like to begin this section with a little lesson in anatomy. This is a, a brain or picture of a human brain. And a part of your brain is called the amygdala. Some of you may have heard of the amygdala before. To keep things simple, because when you talk about neuroanatomy, you can get complicated very quickly. So let's keep things simple. The amygdala is largely responsible for the fact that we as humans feel before we think. It's the emotional center, if you will, of our brain. It's the part of our brain that processes emotions before our um, neocortex or new brain which is the front of our brain and where we can make rational decisions and think through the implications of the choices we make. Emotion comes before thought. It's the way we as humans are wired. Now, the reason for this is pretty clear. You know, hundreds, well, maybe not hundreds, tens of thousands of years ago, when our ancestors 
lived on the savanna in caves and faced existential threats every day, it was very important for them to feel before they thought. Let's say that they were out hunting and came across a hungry saber-toothed tiger that was snarling and salivating, okay? Well, if our cave ancestors stood and contemplated what they should do in that moment, gee, uh, I wonder what I need to do here. I'm faced with this predator. Uh, it doesn't look good for me. And I ought to think through um, my options, right? They would quickly become hot lunch. So it made um, sense, if you will, for the fight or flight response to develop or evolve before our ability to, to think rationally and coherently. So we'd either, you know, I say we, but our ancestors would either fight the animal with a spear or a rock, or the alternative was to run up the nearest tree. But this is where we get the emergence of the familiar phrase fight or flight, okay? And the amygdala is largely responsible for that fight or flight reaction or impulse. Now, most of us are not facing existential threats these days, but the fight or flight response is still very much with us, especially or, you know, um, particularly when we are involved in a career transition, which is very much a roller coaster ride. And we have um, threats, if you will, if not physical threats, but threats to our, you know, our psychological well-being, if, you, if, if I may, every day. Sometimes those psychological threats to our, uh, to our cells manifest in a fight response where we lash out, we get agitated, we get frustrated, we tear up our resume, we, you know, we do things that would be associated with a fight reaction, or the other is the flight reaction. We shut down, we disengage, we spend the day in bed. We, we say, uh, what's the point of it all, okay? Both of those extreme reactions, fight or flight, are largely coming uh, about from our amygdalas. Now, one way to think about this is the hare brain and the tortoise brain. Think of the amygdala, fight or flight, as the hare brain, and the tortoise brain as our thinking brain, okay? Which do you think when it perceives a threat, certainly to our physical selves, but also to our mental and psychological well-being, which do you think responds quickest? The hare brain, the emotional part of our brain, or the tortoise brain, the IQ thinking part of our brain? Which responds quickest to a perceived threat to our physical or psychological well-being? Which is it? Any thoughts in the room? Emotional. So is it emotional, a vote for emotional? Anybody agree? Anyone think? My knee jerk reaction is the hair. The hair brain, okay. Well, if you selected hair, you are right. The hair brain gets way out ahead of the tortoise brain. Neuroscientists using fMRI technology to map brain activity have discovered that the hair brain, the emotional part of our brain, responds up to 100 times faster than our thinking brain when we perceive a threat. And that threat may not even be a real threat. It could be a perceived threat. And again, here, we're not necessarily talking about threats to our physical well-being, although the same process is very much, you know, in operation. But here, when we talk about job transitions, we're really talking about psychological threat. So when that emotional hair gets way out ahead of our thinking brain, bad things happen. We act irrationally. We say things we regret. We do things that don't serve us. We go down unproductive, unconstructive pathways. We've all been there, right? 
the good news, I suppose, is we're not alone. We're sort of wired that way. Our circuitry has evolved so that we feel before we think. And if you've ever heard somebody to say, I was so angry, I couldn't think straight, or I was so stressed, I couldn't think straight, that's exactly what's happening. So where does self-management come into play here? What we need, folks, is a way to interrupt the, um, the, the, the process between negative stimulus and unconstructive reaction. Either the fight reaction, which leads to, you know, the top picture potentially, or yes, the bottom reaction where we disengage, cut ourselves off, uh, disconnect, shut down, get depressed. Both of these are reflections of the hair brain, fight or flight, but neither, I think you would agree, is particularly helpful or constructive. How can we drive a wedge in the middle of that process? Well, it's not very easy, is it? I heard someone say knee jerk reaction. That's, that's a pretty accurate uh, description. Knee jerk, right? Impulsive, reactive, without thinking. This is a hallmark of what we call an amygdala hijack. It's literally called an amygdala hijack when the, our emotions hijack our thinking brains and we do or say things that we regret. Now I've looked into this question. How do you interrupt this dynamic, this process? And the best thing I can come up with really is derived from um, an old classic Coca-Cola advertisement from the 30s. The pause that refreshes. Now you can probably guess which aspect of this commercial or this advertisement is the key to self-management. And it is in fact, the pause. Now, whether or not you avail yourself of a Coca-Cola is up to you, but the pause is the key. If we can develop the ability to pause, that stressor comes in, that whatever that is, uh, an email, something that somebody says to us, something that didn't go our way. If we're able to pause, even for a few seconds, to allow our tortoise brain to catch up with our hair brain, that's when our response is thoughtful and leads us, presumably, to an action that is going to serve us as opposed to an action that is going to, um, you know, uh, uh, negatively impact our effectiveness. Now we know that between stimulus and reaction, there's typically very little space. If you've ever gone from zero to 100 and lost your temper, you know that that happens very quickly. And I've talked about the evolutionary uh, rationale for, for, for why that is. We literally have to work against thousands of years of evolution in order to learn to pause. But the good news is you can do it because I know a lot of people that do it well. And here are some ways to do it. You can take a walk. You can just remove yourself from the stimulus if you can. Get a drink of cold water. A lot of people exercise. Um, a lot of people, ah, take deep breaths. Whatever it is, develop the discipline not to react impulsively. But to take a few beats, move through that moment, you're engaging your tortoise brain, your thinking brain, and now before you do something rash, you will respond in a much more thoughtful way. The times in my career where I've gotten a snarky email or, or a news that wasn't particularly uh, you know, positive or whatever, I used to want to react, you know, type, 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 reply, didn't serve me didn't serve me. So I sat back, I learned to breathe, I learned to get up and physically remove myself from this from the stimulus, whatever it is. And inevitably, when I came back, whether whatever it was, 
I was in a much better emotional place to respond thoughtfully, constructively in a way that, you know, reflected the kind of person that, that, that I want to be. Now, that's a little bit more difficult if you are face to face with a person. It's not easy to say, you know what, you're really ticking me off right now. I'm going to go for a quick walk. Can't really do that. So you need to sort of do this internally. You need to have some kind of emotional release valve that you can go to internally that will provide relief for you. And for I can't tell you what that should be, but you, you need to have one. You, you need to have some somewhere where you can go if you can't physically remove yourself from the situation that provides you with calm, that provides you with um, with reassurance. What it could be a Bible verse. I people have said that it could be a line of poetry. It could be the mantra, you know, stay cool, stay cool, stay cool, you know, whatever it is for you. Self management uh, is a key to navigating these moments of stress that are inevitable when it comes to a career transition. Okay, that's one facet of self management. Speak when you are angry and you will make the best speech you will ever regret. Email when you're angry and you'll send the best email you'll ever regret. Right. Um, you get the idea. Now, there's another aspect of self-management that I think it's really important for those of you in career transition to consider. It's a story or it comes from a story about two monks and it goes like this. So two traveling Buddhist monks, they needed to cross a swift but shallow river. And a young woman stood on the bank nearby and she also needed to cross, but she was afraid. And so she asked for help. The two monks, as they often do, had taken vows to never touch a woman. And so one of the monks hesitated. But the other picked her up and carried her across the river and let her down gently on the other side. Now, the two monks continued their journey in silence for some time until one blurted out, you took vows to never touch a woman. How could you have picked her up like that? So he was really annoyed. And the other monk replied, brother, I set her down at least an hour ago. So why are you still carrying her? Why are you still carrying her? I think the lesson here for all of us, but especially for those of us in career transition, is anything that costs you your peace is too expensive. We need to learn to let it go. That's a key part of self-management, at least the way I view it. What are you stewing about or dwelling on that you need to stop caring? Maybe it's resentment that you were passed over for a position. Maybe it's jealousy that somebody got the role that you thought you were perfect for. I, we stew about all kinds of things. It's important that we learn to let that stuff go. Easier said than done, I realize. Um, some of us have a handbag worth of stuff that we are dwelling on. Some of us have a U-Haul worth of stuff that we are dwelling on. Whatever it is for you, part of self-management is to come to that point where you say, this is no longer serving me. And, and let it go, either by talking with somebody you trust or just recognizing that this is something that is no longer um, enhancing your mental or physical health. It could be a moment in time. It could be a habit. It could be a mindset. It could be a voice, a critical voice that always tells you you're not good enough, you're not experienced enough, you're too this, you're too that. And you say, you know what? I'm done, I'm done. So that's another aspect of self-management. And the final piece I wanna share with you, also relevant to career transitions, is this notion of resilience. Talking about choices today, bending, or breaking in the face of adversity. 
Resilient people make a conscious choice about which book, which of these two books they're going to read from. These are actual books, but I'm using them metaphorically for this discussion. On the left, we have the book of the go-getter. Some people read from that book. You know who they are. They're action oriented. They set goals. They're ambitious. They, they, they're confident and they go after what they want with zeal and enthusiasm. Those who read from the book on the right, we know those folks too. They blame others. They never take accountability for things. They point fingers. One of the ways that you can tell which book somebody might be reading from is by the language they use. If you hear somebody say, what can I do? What can I do to learn more about this company? What can I do to be more effective in interviews? What can I do to be more successful at networking? You have yourself a go-getter. If you hear someone say, what can I do in a resigned way, same words, very different, what? Emotional state coming from a very different emotional place. Um, you're probably dealing with a victim. Okay. If you hear, what's my role here? In other words, what do I need to do differently? How am I contributing to the results I'm getting, the outcomes I'm getting? Right? Am I going to blame luck? Am I going to blame fate? Am I going to blame somebody else? Right? It's not my fault. I have the worst luck, blah, blah, blah. Go-getters are like, all right, what can I do? What, am, what chords am I playing, potentially, that are not getting me the results I want? Victims just go, eh. You know, they, they blame everything, but they're not willing to turn the mirror on themselves and reflect on, what different chords do I need to play to get different results? And finally, go-getters come from a growth mindset. I can always get better. I'm good today, but tomorrow I'm going to be even better, and the day after I'll be even better than that. And victims say, I am who I am, right? They come from a, a mindset of, you know, I am the sum total of my habits and, and thoughts and emotions uh, that, that I reflect me today. And growth or improvement or enhancement or strengthening is either something I'm not able to do or not willing to do. Because I have met individuals who are not willing to do the kind of self-development that actually would have helped them. Which side, left or right, are you going to be? Which book are you going to read from? Because I'll tell you this. The language we use creates the reality we experience. The language we use creates the reality we experience. Use the tools of self-awareness that I taught you to tune into the language you use every day. The narrative that you've established for yourself about your competence, about your abilities, about your gifts, your skills, whatever. You have developed a narrative. Is that narrative working for you? Because if it's, if it's always a victim narrative, what if, how come, why didn't, guess what? That's going to start to inform your reality. And your outcomes and results, not surprisingly, are going to mirror the language and narrative that you've created for yourself. Now, I'm not saying that every day needs to be sunshine and rainbows. But I am saying part of self-management is, is um, choosing to be resilient or not, choosing to bend or break. You could argue that that's largely genetic, and there maybe is a genetic component, but don't kid yourself, that's also a choice. You can choose to be a resilient individual in the face of adversity or an unresilient person, depending on which book you read from. Some questions to help you in your journey. Think about the last time you exhibited poor self-management. Did you lose your temper, fight? Did you shut down and disconnect and disengage from the world, flight? What happened? What was the outcome when you went down that path? Did it serve you? 
And if you had a do-over, what might you do differently? What different chords might you play to get different results? And what role might the pause button play? As you reflect on the last time the hair brain took over, think about whether it served you or not. And think about if I had pressed the pause button, might I have experienced a different outcome? So again, this is self-awareness, an exercise in self-awareness. You're bringing awareness to the last time your hair brain took over, but essentially it's also an exercise in self-management. What might I have done better in the past so that I can do differently in the future? That's really what this is about. Okay, so I'm aware of the time and I, I wanna spend at least a few minutes talking about the other side of the coin we had self-awareness, self-management. That's all about us, ourselves. And now we want to focus on our relationships, the way we interact with other people. Social awareness, recognizing the needs of others with a heightened sense of empathy. What is empathy? Well, think about it this way, folks. All of us are authors of a book called My Autobiography. Inside this book are all the things that make you unique. Your background, your upbringing, your religion, your values, your beliefs, your hopes, your dreams, your aspirations, everything that makes you the unique person that you are. Our autobiographies, which begin the day we're born and end the day that we're no longer here, form a filter or a lens through which we perceive the world. And I think that you would agree that no one autobiography is exactly the same as anyone else, which is why no matter how hard we try, we can never see things in exactly the same way. Nobody has the same exact beliefs, assumptions, uh, opinions, values as you. Maybe close, but probably not identical. And so it's inevitable that we are going to um, come up against people with different perspectives, different points of view, right? Here's another way of demonstrating that phenomenon. In this case, one person's salvation, you know, is a boat and the other person's salvation is land. You get it. But it's a kind of an apt metaphor for the challenges and issues and problems that we regularly face in life. One person sees it one way, one person sees it the other way. And so what we inevitably do is we entrench ourselves in our point of view, they entrench themselves in their point of view, and that's how conflict arises. Social awareness is about empathy, the ability to put yourself in, in their shoes, metaphorically speaking, and see the issue, the problem, whatever it is, through their eyes. Okay, it's about putting our autobiography aside momentarily and cracking open their autobiography. Doesn't mean we necessarily agree with them. It just means that we acknowledge the validity of their perspective, although it may differ from ours. Now, what's the connection between this notion and career transition? Well, out of the gate, we can think about social awareness in terms of the homework that you do to learn about the employer. Putting yourself in the shoes of the employer or putting yourself in the shoes of the recruiter or putting yourself in the shoes of the interviewer, what might you want to see out of a prospective candidate? Well, you would want to see that they'd done some homework about the company or the organization, thereby demonstrating a keen interest in the role. So asking yourself, who are the key players? What are their values and priorities? What are their primary concerns? What is the culture like? What are their key projects and plans? Doing your homework before the interview, putting yourself in the shoes of that interviewer and doing some good old fashioned research so that when you come to that interview and the person says, so Mike, do you have any questions for me? You go, as a matter of fact, I do. 
I recently read that so and so, your CEO or your CFO, did this or that. How might this impact our team or our department if I was fortunate enough to, to join the team? Or um, tell me a little bit about the culture here. I noticed that uh, outside in the lobby, it says uh, our people are our greatest asset. I'm curious how that notion shows up or manifests in the day-to-day -day work uh, of the team, right? If I'm the interviewer, I'm thinking to myself, wow, this candidate is, is, is distinguishing themselves from all the other candidates I just saw this morning that didn't ask any good questions. So that's a very simple but powerful way of leveraging social awareness to put yourself in the shoes of the prospect and do some homework so that you look, uh, so that you are knowledgeable and can demonstrate that knowledge uh, appropriately. Okay. Another way of leveraging this idea of social awareness, I call flipping the script, flipping the script. Most people in career transition are in a what's, it, what's in it for me mode. What's in it for me? Uh, what's the salary? What's the benefits? What's the perks? What's the vacation policy? Right? Now, that's normal and certainly not a bad thing. But I would suggest if you really want to leverage social awareness, flip it to what's in it for them. Them being whoever it is that you are trying to get a job from. Okay? Or whoever it is you're trying to get information from through networking. What's in it for them? There needs to be a little what's in it for me, but think about how do my skills, how will my background, how will my specific expertise benefit them? Because I'll tell you what, folks, during an interview, there's one question on the mind of that interviewer or recruiter, and it's this, how will this person help me or my team succeed? That's it. Every answer you give, every response you give, the person on the other side of the desk or on the other side of the screen is filtering it through that question. How, if I hire this person, how are they going to help me or my team be successful? If you can um, articulate your responses in a way that demonstrates value to the employer, value to the organization. For example, I'm glad you asked that. Yes, I do in fact have 10 years of XYZ experience. And in doing some research on your team, I learned that your team very often is tasked with ABC. Um, and if I, if I may be honest, I, I feel that my experience in XYZ might prove extremely beneficial for your team because I have done that for over a decade. I, I am uh, quite knowledgeable about the ins and outs of that process. I have a few examples I can share with you. You get the idea. Now, the whole time the interviewer is thinking, ah, okay, yeah, it's starting to come into focus. This person is starting to demonstrate their value to me. That is going to put you in an advantageous position over the other candidates who are just like, yeah, what's the, uh, what's the vacation policy here? Okay. So remember and practice. You should be practicing your interview uh, answers anyway. Practice um, framing them as what's in it for them, as opposed to so solely what's in it for you, okay? One other real quick thing is to remember that people make a first impression of you in about seven seconds. Research suggests that people make first impressions in about seven seconds. That's not a lot of time. So you need to have your three V's aligned, what they're seeing, what they're hearing, and the language you're using. When those are in alignment, you will look competent, you will look confident, and you will be at your best. When those three V's are out of alignment, you will look lost, you will look uh, anxious, you will look stressed. <clears throat> the visual, obviously how you look. I don't have to tell this group that you need to look the part for networking events, interviews, et cetera, but it goes beyond that. Eye contact, right? Eye contact connotes confidence, interest, makes that connection. You'll notice I'm looking at the camera this whole time. I'm not looking here. I'm not looking here because the camera 
is a surrogate for you. I don't see you, but I know you're there and I'm looking at the camera as if you were face to face with me. If I'm down here or here or here, it's compromising my effectiveness in the interaction. Posture, you'll notice that I am sitting erect. I'm sitting shoulders back, eyes forward. I'm not hunched, I'm not leaning to one side. I'm not, right? These are things that people notice and it might not disqualify you from contention, but people do make mental notes of how you are showing up physically not fiddling. If I were here talking to you, you know, doing this stuff or, you know, women with long hair and men with long hair, you know, have a, sometimes I've seen this, you know, playing with hair. No, that's why practicing is so important or filming yourself, recording yourself or, or practicing with a, with a colleague. And they'll say, you know, Mike, you, you tapped your pen against your cheek the, the entire time. And I'll say, I did. I was completely unaware. Okay. So, Again, not fiddling. The second V, vocal, articulation, volume, rate. Most people speak quickly when they're anxious. Practice slowing down, speaking at a, at a relaxed pace. Whoop, sorry, speaking at a relaxed pace. Emphasis, pausing. Great, watch great speakers on YouTube, TEDx. Notice how they emphasize certain points or pause for dramatic effect. Um, your tone, is it animated? Is it alive? Is it energetic? Or are you coming across, you know, like you just rolled out of bed? It's amazing how people sometimes show up in interviews, both virtual and in person, and give a half-baked effort and then wonder why, you know, they didn't get the job. It's because the chords they play just didn't didn't land effectively with the with the other person. And these are things we don't typically think about. You convey a lot in the in the vitality of your voice. Use it, optimize it. Visual, vocal and verbal, the actual words you use. Are your ideas well thought out and smooth transitions and are your responses clear and logically organized? Is every other word a filler, an um, a like, uh, an ah? Uh, I, just, I just did it myself. Have you ever spoken to somebody where it's just filler after filler after filler, ah, uh, like? Pretty soon you start focusing on the fillers and not on the substance. So practice. You could say, boy, I had 32 likes in the span of 10 minutes. I really need to work on that. S slang, uh, inappropriate language. I don't mean profanity. I just mean like overly casual or informal language or rising intonation where every sentence sounds like a question because your voice is going up at the end. And so after a while, uh, this is a really bad habit because uh, it becomes very annoying for the listener. And if this continues, the listener will eventually check out. Okay, three V's. When you look the part, sound the part, and are using appropriate words for the role, you're going to be in good shape. And exhibiting social awareness during virtual interviews, very important. If you feel you're not good at it or can get or should get better at it, practice, read about it. There's so many videos on YouTube. The art of communicating virtually is different than the art of communicating in person. Don't just think it's the same thing. It will require a different skill set of you. Make the choice to practice and get better. Get those three V's aligned. Okay. Now the fourth and final a category of emotional intelligence I want to share with you is relationship management. The manner, so, so we had self-awareness, self-management, social awareness, or empathy. How can you put yourself in the shoes of the other person and behave accordingly? That was the last part. And now we're going to talk about relationship management. For me, for people in career transition, 
the best use of relationship management or the best arena to leverage relationship management is in your networking. It's in your networking. It's in your networking that your skills around relationship management really come to the fore. And this is just a little networking humor, right? I always struggle with smart casual, have the, uh, the guy there on the left, on the right, that's the anonymous LinkedIn member. They never introduce themselves. They just stand there and watch. Right? So that's uh, obviously uh, poking fun at the people on LinkedIn that just they don't have a profile picture. You get it. So I thought I'd start with a little networking humor. But here are 10 top tips for effective networking. Some of them might be very obvious, others less obvious. And in the next, you know, two or three or four minutes that I have until I conclude, why don't we take a minute right now to, if you're at the library, pick one of these 10 that you think is particularly important and perhaps one that you want to incorporate into your toolkit of tools, of networking tools. And if you are joining us virtually, you can just type in chat the number of the item, again, that resonates for you or that you think is particularly important or that you want to improve. Go ahead and take a minute to do that now. And if you incorporate these 10 or some of these 10, you will see or ought to see an improvement in the quality and, um, and, and outcomes of your networking. So let's see what sort of strikes a chord for you. So sorry to come through and chat. And folks, if you have a number, um, just shout it out, and I'll make sure Michael hears that as well. But number 10 in the chat. Yes. So as other people are thinking, let me just quickly address number 10. This has always been an issue for me. Uh, I never want to make someone feel like I don't value them or I've heard enough from them. And the way to extricate myself from an interaction has always been something that, that you know, I've thought about. So I saw a networking expert suggest this technique. After a few minutes, when you feel you've had enough, you say something like, well, you know, I, I promised myself I'd circulate. Um, so I just want to take a moment and thank you so much. This was very enlightening and very enjoyable. I, if I may, I'd love to follow up with you. And they say, absolutely, right? And that goes to number six, follow up within 48 hours. Um, Specific, it was so nice meeting you at the such and such event. Uh, when you told me to X, Y, and Z, I found that extremely helpful. Okay, so yes. Um, if you say, I promised myself I'd circulate, it really has been lovely talking to you. Nobody is going to take offense. Nobody is going to feel like uh, you devalued their that interaction. And so that is something that I've started to use um, with great success. So excellent. Others. Also, when uh, people have mentioned number five and number three. Good. Perfect. Yes, number three. Yeah. Real quick. So I don't know about you. I am inundated with networking possibilities every day. I couldn't possibly attend every one of them, nor do I want to attend all of them. So I select, I'm very selective and I'm okay with, you know what, if I don't go to that event, sure. Am I potentially missing an opportunity? Yeah. But I have to be judicious with my time. So I'm gonna attend events that, that I find interesting. They might not even be in my area. It might be a gathering of people that I just wanna to get to know because it sounds like they're doing interesting work. And I show up and they say, so Mike, you're, are you also um, a bird watcher? I don't know why I, why, why I came up with that. I go, no, actually I'm not, but I'd like to learn more about it. It sounds interesting to me, guess what? I talked to a, a, one of the bird watchers. They uh, they are an HR director for a company, and they're looking for a trainer. What? Do, how, right? So why would I go to a bird watching networking event if I'm not a bird watcher? Because it is interesting to me. And if something is interesting to me, I'm going to show up with cords that are energetic, enthusiastic, and passionate as opposed to going to the same old networking event where it's just like, nah, 
I think I should come here, but I'm not particularly interested in being here. So I would almost say, think about going to an event outside of your normal circle, if it interests you, because you never know who you're gonna meet and that interest and that enthusiasm is gonna come through. Now, number five, yes. If you, were able, if you get a list of, of attendees, do some research, not on all 100 people, but on a handful of people. Oh, this person is the lead engineer at uh, such and such company. I'm going to I'm going to make it a, an effort to seek them out and I'm not just going to waste their time. I'm going to ask them a very specific question and you find that person and say, I want to be sensitive to your time. I know there's a lot of folks here you probably want to meet, but I was looking at your LinkedIn profile and I noticed that you have something in your background that's very similar to mine. And I was wondering how you transitioned from from A to B, because I'm going through that right now. And I go, yeah, I'd love to tell you about that specific when you follow up. Thank you so much for uh, sharing your experience with whatever it was. See, all of these sort of work together. You can improve one or two, but if you improve or work on improving, you know, all of them, think about them as inter interconnected and your whole networking game will improve if you, over time, incorporate all 10 of these. But of course, start small. Start with one or two. You'll get some success and then you'll move on to another one. And if you're already doing some of these and seeing success, obviously you want to continue. So number two, networking is not about making small talk or, gee, I have to let everybody know how terrific I am and I'm, I'm shy or I'm humble and I'm not comfortable doing that. That's not what it is. Think about what we're talking, relationship management. Relationship, that's what we're talking about. Networking is about building meaningful connections. If you go and you talk to 100 people and you had a good time but didn't make any meaningful connections with anybody, what's the point? But if you talk to five people and made meaningful connections with two, those two are going to be far more valuable to you than you know talking to 50. Quality, not quantity, when it comes to networking. Quality, not quantity. So some things for you to think about. Um, we don't necessarily have to do this right now, but maybe at future PSG uh, Mercer County events, you can share things that have worked for you. Um, if you have a colleague that you talk to frequently, ask them what networking practices have been helpful for you and, and what haven't, you know, so that I can avoid them. And so there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. We have in about an hour and 15 minutes taken you know, a, a pretty deep dive in emotional intelligence, something that we could have spent, you know, weeks talking about. But you have now, I hope, a good notion of what it is, the four mm, dimensions of emotional intelligence, and most importantly, how you can leverage emotional intelligence in your career transition to, you know, help you land the position that you want. Um, and I encourage you to keep thinking about ways of being more emotional, more emotionally intelligent in your tasks and in your activities associated with your career transition. And in conclusion, I would say that life is 10% what happens to us and 90% how we react to it. If you're in career transition, Lord knows you're going to come up against obstacles and disappointments and frustrations and things that don't work out. And you know what? That's what makes landing the right jobs so much sweeter. But along the way, along the journey, yes, some things are outside of our control. But I maintain that our reaction, our response, the chords we play are largely within our control. And that's where emotional intelligence really comes into play. I want to thank everybody for your time today. I, I hope that this was helpful. I know it wasn't maybe a traditional webinar on career transitions, but it is something that's maybe not talked about or discussed as much as it ought to be, because you can see the foundations of an effective career transition, you know, really is the, uh, e, the EQ competences we've been talking about. I encourage you to reach out to me. My LinkedIn profile is Michael Y. Brenner. Uh, look for the guy holding the saxophone. That's how you'll know you got the right Michael Brenner. 
my website, if you want to know more about what I do, rightcordleadership.com. Uh, don't forget the H in cord, C-H-O-R-D. And, uh, you know, if you want to write me, uh, I'm happy to serve as a, an ongoing resource for you in any way that I can. You can connect with me at Michael at rightcordleadership.com. With that, I will stop sharing, turn it over to David. Uh, I will send him the deck. I imagine he will uh, distribute it to those of you who are interested in getting the deck. Uh, and I will uh, allow him a minute or two now for some final comments. Thank you. Yep, good. Thank you. Oh, we got some applause here. And hopefully, thank you. So see some finger snapping online. And also, folks, if you have any questions, this would be your opportunity. If you're in the room, just ask it to step up to the microphone so that everybody hears. There is one question posted in chat, came up a while ago from Pat. Um, what are ideas for side hustle jobs while looking for your professional job? One more time, David. What are ideas for side hustle jobs while looking for your professional job? You might say saxophone playing, but. <laughs> <laughs> an, an interesting question. Um, and a difficult one for me to answer because well, maybe maybe what's appropriate how to go about looking for that you know considering uh, what we've talked about well okay so in the interest of specificity which has certainly been a theme of today's um, program um, some of you might uh, want to you know, here's a side this is one of my side hustle jobs is being an adjunct instructor so my main gig is right cord leadership uh, but you know I I, I I make, uh, I make a little bit additional income teaching. Now, those of you who may be interested in teaching, not becoming a full-time professor, but adjuncting like me, uh, I would say, um, I would follow a lot of the steps that I just shared with you. First of all, let's uh, just use HR as an example, because it's a world that I know, right? I don't know how many countless HR departments or programs they might be at universities around the country and now with virtual around the world. So I would identify 10 to 15 schools or universities that um, just like you might identify, you know, a handful of people at a networking event you want to spend time with. Identify a few. You could Google top HR departments or whatever it is that you want to teach uh, in, in the U.S. Come up with 10 or 15 universities or colleges go on their websites to the department page and get a name. There will be the head of whoever on the page and write them a very sincere, authentic, uh, curious email. I am so-and-so, uh, this is my background. Uh, I've always wanted to teach. Um, I've, these are the skills I have that I think would be a good teacher. I'm at the beginning of my uh, journey to find out what it requires. And I'd love to take five or 10 minutes of your time uh, to, to find out what would be involved. And uh, that's how you do it. So you could apply that to anything you might want to do. Um, talk to people who are doing it. Talk to people who are doing it. And the only way to do that is homework and research, LinkedIn, uh, your normal networking. That is that is an emergency warning uh, well, for, for storms, storms. Yeah. But that, yeah, that, you, that's what I do. You may want to put on your heart. Identify someone, identify someone doing the side hustle that, that you're interested in and invite them for coffee, invite them for lunch and pick their brain. Yeah, terrific. And Michael, you're wearing a, you know, the nice hat. You mentioned that. Put on your hard hat. you got a warning. So put on something that will protect you. Any other questions? Yeah, might be some, I don't know, like tornadoes or something. Yeah. Oh, and so here comes Bill. Yep. I'm Michael. This is Bill Pagula. Can you hear me? Yes, Bill. Okay. Um, you gave us some really good tools about self-awareness. Uh, how do you? Uh, those tools are also you can turn those tools outward, right? And perhaps when you're having a conversation or situation, you find that the uh, the person you're dealing with uh, is in fight or flight. And you know that, uh, uh oh, you know, it's uh, how do you deal with how do you react to that? If the person you're interacting with is in is in fight or flight. Yeah, or say they're in fight. Uh, oh, 
Yeah, that could be a very long conversation. So you could learn the skills of, of having difficult conversations or difficult encounters. A book that I would recommend if you're so inclined to read it is uh, called Crucial Conversations. It's a, been a bestseller for years. I was certified at one time in the methodology for Crucial Conversations, but the, the fact that it is a methodology I think is helpful because it will walk you through specific steps you should take if somebody is um uh lashing out aggressive uh irrational and it will also walk you through steps to take the opposite if somebody is um uh, shutting down checking out uh disconnecting and there's really you know there there are skills that you can learn and hone of course they take practice i would say fundamentally bill what you want to do is leverage social awareness demonstrate empathy uh the person is probably not looking for your opinion at that point they're just perhaps looking for somebody to listen and what i've learned is that once somebody realizes that you care about them and you care about their problem that you acknowledge the validity of their situation whether or not you agree with it the volume comes down the 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 the, the gesticulation comes down the uh the, to the tortoise brain starts to catch up with the hare brain and it's at that point where you can start having a more meaningful, thoughtful conversation. Uh, so I, I, I completely understand. I understand if I was in your shoes, I would probably be just as frustrated as you are. Help me understand how I can help you. Let's, let's see if we can work on this together. See, there's nothing there about here's what you should do, or here's what you ought to do, or here's what I would do. You know, it's, it's about first de-escalation, engaging the thinking brain, and then going to problem solving. Most, most of us leap to problem solving at a point where the, the other person's just not ready to hear it, right? So those are some very brief tips, but I would also look into crucial conversations or a similar resource to learn and understand the skills to do that more in depth. Yep, we're getting a thumbs up, so good. Thank you very much. Any last thoughts or questions from anyone in here? Yeah, we've got uh, someone coming up to the microphone. Press the button, make sure it's green. Hi, Mike, thank you for your time. Uh, another Mike at this end. Also, Temple Brown, we have a few things in common. The question that I have for you, kind of continuing on your music metaphor, I am a jazz fan. Oh. The person that I'm interviewing with hates jazz, loves country western. I personally hate country western. <laughs> Is there any way of melding those two differences together? How would you go about doing it? Or do you just chalk it up as, okay, that was a good experience. This is not going to work. Uh, what's next? Well, I, I, I wouldn't... Um... I wouldn't turn down an opportunity over mismatched musical preferences. So I hope that you're not thinking of of uh, shutting someone out potentially because they, they don't like the music you like. Uh, I'm being sort of facetious, but um, to me, I mean, I, I'm sorry, I didn't quite catch your name. Michael. That, 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 oh, Michael. Okay, yeah. So what's the commonality there? On the surface, it looks like you have the, you know, your polar extremes, you love jazz, this person doesn't, they love country western, you don't. What's the common, what's the obvious commonality? You both like what? Music. music. You music. both like music. Why not leverage that commonality rather than focus on the on the on the stark difference? And again, I don't know the context in which this conversation would come up. It might sound something like, hey, I understand uh or I read somewhere that you're also a music aficionado. I'm also a music aficionado. Or I also love music, or I'm also a musician. I'm interested, what, what, what kind of music do you enjoy listening to? Oh, they say, I love country western. Now inside you're making a face, you go, Ugh. <laughs> you go country west, I mean, this is, I don't like country western either, but, but, but I, would, I wouldn't let that on. Uh, I, I would say, oh, country western. Uh, yeah, I'm not that familiar with that genre. I know a couple of key musicians in that genre, um, and then maybe do some homework. If so, like, oh, one I know, I think I've heard of is um, Garth Brooks. I, I know we haven't heard much of Garth Brooks lately. Is, is he? Is, am I right? Is that kind of like the kind of person you want? 
or maybe more contemporary figure. Um, I don't I don't know much about country music, but you get the idea. And then maybe they go like, well, what, what do you like to listen to? And you go, I like jazz. And they go, I don't really like jazz. I go, yeah, it's an acquired taste, but I bet the more you listen to it, the more you'd like it. If you're interested, I would be more than happy to share with you a beginner's guide to jazz. And maybe you'd, you know, you'd get a different, see what I'm doing? I'm taking what seems to be something that's dividing us and I'm turning it into something that bonds us. And you can do that with anything. I'm not a big sports person. I don't really follow sports, but if I go into an office and I see sports trophies and sports plaques, and then you better believe I'm going to find a way to bring that into a conversation because I want to create connection. I don't want to create disconnection. So that's my quick answer for you, Michael. Okay, you got an affirmation, a nod, so that was yeah. good as well. And it looks like a question from Gary. You'll please step up to the mic. This is from Gary. Hi, Mike. Hi, Gary. Hi, Gary. I am. Uh, <laughs> you hear me all right? Hey. Yes. I'm Gary Landy. I'm a career coach. I'm a member of the PSG Mercer uh, Executive Committee. Um, and in the course of my work, of course, uh, working with a lot of people, one of the things that I see uh, right away as a major challenge in job search is dealing with failure. There's so much time that you spend in the search process of talking with people that um, really doesn't come to anything. So when I think about emotional intelligence, uh, I jumped to another subject that I'd like very much to you to talk about, and that is the emotional endurance that it takes to continue a successful job search. Yeah. Um, I think that resilience or endurance is something that is you know obviously a, a key ingredient in any journey we might take to achieve an important goal um i think that tenacity persistence um resilience yes you absolutely need to have those things uh, if you're in a career transition. And some of us have those things more than others. Um, for me, it really comes down to the, the, the self-narrative that we've created for ourselves. Um, it reminds me of, uh, and I've talked about this with clients, there's a great scene in the movie uh, Rocky, it's called Rocky Balboa. So after Rocky IV, I think it was Rocky V, and then Rocky VI was called Rocky Balboa. And in this particular movie, Rocky has a son, a young son. And Rocky obviously is going to go back into the ring. His son doesn't want him to because he thinks his dad's going to get beat up real good. And that as a result, the son's reputation is going to take a hit. And it's a great little speech from Rocky that he gives his son because he says, um, something to the effect of, you know, no fighter hits quite as hard as life. And it's not as many times, it's not about how many times you get hit, it's about how many times you get up. And as long as you keep saying, you know, pointing fingers, and it was them, and it's this, and it's bad luck, and I'm not good enough, uh, you're never going to achieve what you want. And he actually says, that's, that's what losers do, and you're not a loser, or words to that effect. And that's always resonated with me, especially during those times where I was like, what's the point? You know, the, the odds are stacked up against me, or there's there, there's so many people vying for this uh, opportunity to speak. What what chance? As soon as I hear that language, I'm, I'm cooked. I'm done. I've created the reality. So building the muscle to go shoo shoo negative narrative shoo shoo <laughs> you know uh be gone with you i have no use for you and getting like rocky said getting back up and being prepared to take a few knocks yeah man i, I wish i could say it wasn't going to be like that but which book are you going to read from the go-getter or the victim 
That's really important. And I would use that. You said you're a coach. I would feel free to use that metaphor if you think it would be helpful. Say, hey, I heard this guy speak about the go-getter book and the, uh, the victim book. Which book are you going to read from? Because I'll tell you, you you're going to get rejected a few times. You're going to get knocked down. You're going to be disappointed. You're going to be frustrated. What chords are you going to play? And, and so that's, you know, that's, that's the key. That's the key. And the person really has to think about that. You can help. You can be a good coach. You could be a good mentor. You can be a good uh, advisor. But ultimately, it comes down to the, to the person. And I think that's a hallmark of any winner. Just like Rocky said, the ability to, to get hit and get hit and get hit in life and get back up. Um, absolutely. Really important. I want to play off what you just said. Um, an expression that uh, somebody gave me many years ago applies. The measure of a man is not when he's standing tall, but how he rises after he falls. That's right. Yes, I'm familiar with that quote, and it's a beautiful quote, and it's true. It's true then, and it's true now, and it would go with any adversity you might face in life. Right? All right. Well, and I, and I would conclude just by saying, as soon as you hear yourself going, "What's the point? I give up. I'm staying in bed. Uh, I'm no good. You've lost." Well, Michael, uh, thank you so much. Yep. Thank you so much. You, you know, I. I'm not going to you know, rehash everything that Michael talked about because we'd be here for another 75 or so minutes. But there were a couple of takeaways that I had uh, I picked up on one right from the beginning when you talked about emotional intelligence. And I was thinking it, it really can be much more important than your IQ or your technical skills, because, you know, the emotional intelligence are going to be your soft skills, your transferable skills, your people skills. Uh, the way you relate to people. So I, I think it becomes very important to focus on the emotional intelligence, understand it, and reflect a little on yourself, and really understand that those are skills that you're going to want to promote about yourself. They'll make you a more valuable employee. That's right. And, and another thought I, I had um, when you said, you know, putting yourself in the shoes of your employer, um, it's really very true even outside the context of this discussion because hiring is a very one-sided uh, process. It's all about the employer. You may have great skills to sell, but they have to be the ones that the employer is looking for. It's a selfish process. But by putting yourself in the shoes of the employer, by walking in his or her shoes, you have a sense of, like you were saying, Michael, what are their values, their needs, and concerns. So very relevant for um, specifically job search. So, um, but thank you very much. I did also put your contact information in the chat. Uh, Michael soon will be sending me the slide deck. I'll post that on our website as I do with others. Uh, this is being recorded. And so um, I will put that in our YouTube channel as well. And just before we wrap up, let you know what's coming up over the next couple of weeks. We will be right back here, June 23rd, with Ed Hahn. Ed Hahn, who is an internal recruiter, uh, he's also been an external recruiter, and he's also a LinkedIn guru, he is going to talk about why the ATS is not your enemy. The ATS is the applicant tra tracking system. And so why the ATS is not your enemy and how to use it more effectively because there are ways and tools for doing that. And that'll be next week. The following week, June 30th, will be our last streaming and recorded meeting. And um, I will be here as the presenter. I'm wearing all the hats today uh, as a nod to Michael wearing a hat. The importance of personal branding for offer negotiation. And so that's what we'll be talking about June 30th. So that's the meetings we have over the next two months. And of course, you can always visit um, some other meetings and groups, our cousin organizations, PSG of Central New Jersey meets on Monday mornings, psgcnj.biz, check them out, and PSG of Mer Mor Morris County meets Wednesday mornings, psgmc.org. So that is our program for today. Those of you who are virtual still, please feel free to hang around and network and talk among yourselves while we will be um, only disabling the sound, you can talk among yourselves and network if you like. And those of us here in person, we will be hanging around a little bit as well, looking forward to our own uh, getting to know each other. So 
Uh, until we get to see each other again real soon, I'll simply say, bye, everybody. <laughs>